Okay, recording is running. So, so if you could just give me a heads up that you see my slides, but you should be seeing them. Yeah, it's all good. Perfect. Okay, then I'll start. Okay, yeah, so hello everyone. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here at uh, another causal inference group. As you'll see, uh, I'm also running one and I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So, so Neil gave me the heads up to do that as well. Um, but yeah, I'm, 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 I'm grateful for being here today with the causal inference interest group. Um, and today's uh, talk is going to be about causal explanations of structural causal models. Uh, that might sound redundant uh, for this very moment because you would figure, well, uh, aren't explanations of SCMs immediately causal? Um, that's the whole point. So, so, so you will figure out eventually. Uh, again, my name is Matej, Matej Zajcevic, um, and I'm affiliated with the TU Darmstadt, as Neil said, with Christian Kersting. But we'll get to that in a minute. So I'll first start with just you know, some base announcement, uh, also in line with what Neil suggested for me, and then uh, I'll be explicitly talking about this, this one work of ours. So uh, it's also the first time for me giving this talk, and uh, it was kind of a last minute thing because we were organizing this workshop, as you'll see in a moment as well. So um, please bear with me that uh, the slides might not be polished or anything, right? So um, I have a timer set here, so I'll, I'll try to look out for, for being within the 45 minute scope. Okay, I'll show it on, on who am I? So uh, as Neil said, I'm, I'm with Christian Kersting uh, at the TU Darmstadt. Uh, it's in Germany, in Darmstadt. Um, I study, well, causality, causal inference, but uh, I've also had some uh, endeavors in, in neuroscience. And I mean, AI is really the thing where, where I'm at, right? Machine learning. So it's kind of the intersection of all these things. Um, also highlighting here, uh, Devendre, who also recently started out his new research group in our group, and I'm also working very closely with him. Uh, previously, he was postdoc at our lab. Uh, also social media, so, so you can follow me on Twitter or, or reach out or, or, or stay in touch on Twitter, but I also run this, this website, this personal website, where I post on all different kinds of things, so, so I keep a kind of open access article blog, um, and, and really just, um, uh, yeah, anything that interests me, whether it's math, sports, uh, whatever. Okay, now for your interest, because you're all in this cause and inference uh, interest group, right, as, as the name implies, and uh, I think I have uh, at least two things which are pretty cool for you, so um, I'm going to talk about them for a second. So the first thing is this uh, causality discussion group, short CDG. Um, we started it this year, um, and it's been going really, really well and uh, super grateful. Um, you can find it here at discuss.causality.link. I'm especially proud of, of getting this domain because it looks pretty cool. Um, so it's, it's really a weekly meeting, right? Um, and, and what happens in these meetings is really just that we uh, essentially have some author, ideally first, first author of a paper in causality, in causality X, uh, AI and machine learning, um, discussing their work, right? And, 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 and it's really a focus on the discussion. So it's not just a classical presentation format, but really we want everyone just to feel free and engaging, right? Um, and, and yeah, the community has been growing. We have like 350 plus members now. Of course, not all of them are always present. It's more like in the 10 to 25% yield, which is, I guess, standard for these kinds of groups. Um, but it's super, super nice um, and, and, and people are enjoying themselves and, and you can tell that the, the group is growing. Um, we have, we have this whole infrastructure essentially so so we have slack where you can really communicate we have the zoom just like here where, where the sessions happen we have a mailing list we have these twitter announcement google calendar announcement so so really please do check it out if uh if you want to have your kind of weekly causality content um we have already completed 21 sessions uh each of them on, on average i'd say it's about one hour and 10 20 minutes um some are a bit longer some a bit shorter um, as you can tell also by the name, we have had some quite prominent people like Julius von Kugelgen, for instance, um, you know, coming up in our sessions and discussing things. Um, so, so yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, while I say prominent, of course, it, it's, it's uh, more like prominent on the, say, student scale, right? So, so we have yet to have our first professor, say, uh, at the session, but, but it's pretty cool and, and all of them are recorded and it's being uh, updated regularly. Um, and, and the recordings are, are on YouTube, but we kind of still keep it, we have kind of an intermediate policy in the sense that we say we keep it a little bit private, so, so only people within the community can, can access it, but like for the community is open to everyone, right? So there's a little bit of a barrier 
um, just you know, so that everyone also feels safe with, with the recordings. So this is for the causality discussion group. I can also uh, drop the link again, or, or you can drop it for the whole group here. The second thing is that we, as I said earlier, so that's why I'm a bit in a hassle with this talk, that we had, um, or we, we organized this, this workshop at NERVS this year, and it just was live now on Friday, it was the workshop on neurocausal and symbolic AI. So for everyone who's also maybe interested in symbolic methods more generally, logic uh, and, and good old fashioned AI, as they call it, this is really what we try to go for. Uh, the blue and, and, and the pink in this case, right, the cause and the symbolic, both of them combining into one because we really just figured as, as essentially concluded also to the workshop that it is kind of the uh, very same community, still de facto there are two camps because the people don't talk to each other and so that's what we try to do. Um, yeah, so you can check out the website, everything is there, uh, really just this is how essentially it looked like, so there's this virtual site from, from NERVS directly. As you can see, we also had the honor to have Yuda Pearl himself with us. Um, and, and on the left side, you can see this, the, the schedule. So, so we really had uh, different oral presentations, different talks, a keynote, a panel, a poster session. So it was really cool. Of course, the interactive parts like the poster session, you cannot participate anymore. Um, but if you're registered at NERVS, you can rewatch the whole workshop at least, right? So that's pretty cool. And, and I don't know how the schedule is right now, whether it's going to be, you know, open to the public at some point but if it will then then be sure that you know i'll post it somewhere uh, really the aim was of bringing together uh, these these different fields right so symbolic and object-centric methods and logic with these formalizations that we have in Perlian causality uh, in order to of course develop next generation ai systems um, again these were our talks just for you for your interest right so so you might recognize some faces so you the Paul gave the open keynote then we had Mosam from IIT Delhi uh, talking about you know, neural models with symbolic representations. Um, then we have Dania Shrita from MIDA. She was uh, talking about causal inference from text. We had Giovanna Mitrovic from DeepMind talking about representation learning and causality. Toby Gerstenberg from Stanford, who is more of a cognitive scientist psychologist, who was talking about uh, causal judgment. And then he, Vandenberg from UCLA, was uh, asking the question whether you know, AI can also learn to reason. So this was the setup. We had 24 submissions, 19 papers, um, plenty of reviewers and area chairs. So um, really nice work. So, so uh, I can also send this to Neil and, and he can send it to you. So in, in your interest. Um, these were the organizers. So we did it together with Thomas Kip, Robert, Christina, Peter, the vendor, of course. And, and, and my advisor was also the <laughs> advisor of the, the workshop. Um, yeah, now back to today's topic. So we have this paper currently under review. Uh, it's called Causal Explanations of SCM, and that's what we're going to talk about. And this is really just a collaboration, so again, with, with my advisor and Dave, but also with Konstantin Rotkopf, who is uh, a cognitive scientist and psychologist uh, at our university. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a too long did not read, right, for, for everyone just who wants to have a kind of uh, takeaway message right away. So, um, yeah, so as a step towards causal explainable interactive learning, and I'm going to tell you about about this in a minute, uh, we really propose a solution to the lack of truly causal explanations from existing methods, right? So, so, so we kind of identified that there's a lack of, of, of causal explanations or what we call truly causal in a sense, or what we argue for should be truly causal. Um, and then we actually propose a solution to this immediately, right? So both identifying it as a problem and then kind of uh, solving the issues we, we identified. So um, I guess this part, usually this would be now kind of, you know, why causality and everything. I'll just skim over it because I'm assuming that the, the group here is, 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 is familiar with this, but still I think it's always nice to remind oneself. So, so really just, I, I like always to take this example from, from Peters et al, uh, from the Elements of Causal Inference book. So you have the scatter plot in 2D and there's the activity of a gene A and a phenotype. And, and you see kind of this nice linear relationship and then you ask yourself, okay, what would happen if suddenly the activity was, was cut to zero, right? So an intervention. Um, and then, you know, you could have the same plot as you can see here, I hope one can see my mouse, um, with, with gene B, which looks very similar and you're asking the same question. But now if you don't uh, consider the causality behind this, so the data generating process, then the conclusions to this, to this red bar here will be different for these two different cases, although, 
you know, just looking at observational data, they look identical, right? So, so in, in, in the upper case, you would be right in kind of predicting the linear relationship. But since in B, there is a confounder, um, you would actually be incorrect. And so, so Peters always used this as a motivation to say that causality is really necessary, at least, you know, if you don't use it, then you have to say that you simply don't know in these situations. And of course, this is uh, non-optimal. Um, yeah, well, the man himself, Jude Pearl, and also in his book, in, uh, book of Why from 2018. So he really just argues, right, that in general, to build truly intelligent machines, teach them cause and effect, and all these impressive achievements of deep learning amount to just curve fitting. Of course, that's a very extreme statement, um, and a lot of people are not happy with this. But it made sense from a provocative standpoint, right? So, um, and 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 truly, so um, as he says himself, as X-rays are to the surgeon, graphs are for causation. And my standpoint, just you know, also for this talk, is really that I believe that as graphs are to causality, causal nets are for AI, right? So this is not what Yudapur said. This is what I say now, um, and I say it because I, I truly think that. Um, um, whether or not it's kind of the final frontier, that's a totally different question. I personally would not believe so um, to, to AI uh, under the assumption that AI is achievable, but um, I truly believe that, you know, the, um, the queries that we can answer, right, the causal queries that we can answer, right, beat interventions, counterfactuals, that the whole language that is being given is a very useful one. And I believe the success so far has shown that um, also that we're talking today in this group. Um, also, again, I, I totally forgot. So if there's any questions, really just do it intermediate, right? Like we can, of course, discuss at the very end. Um, and and, and um, I've designed the talk in such a way that, you know, some parts might raise a question, but get answers eventually. Um, but really just feel free to interrupt me at any point. Okay, so now to the background for the work. So, so just the things kind of that we need for discussing what, what I'm going to show today. So yeah, just causal inference 101, right? So usually we talk about the structural causal model in, in, in Perlin causality, right? However you formalize it for the moment now, I have here a kind of way of, of doing it as, as, as done in, in Peters et al. But nowadays I would even subscribe to a different one. Um, in general, right, it's just describing with this, these deterministic functions, this deterministic uh, mechanism essentially, uh, how you map uh, the parents and, and, and some noise, some unknown model part onto the actual value variables that you care about. And then there's a distribution on these unmodeled parts, right? These exogenous terms, and that essentially determines then uh, the stochasticity of the whole system. Um, and then interventions are a key key point here, right? The key view, be it you know hard interventions or soft interventions, but ultimately that you can really replace these equations uh, by something else. Um, and as I believe, there's a very nice view also on um, on uh, uh, valuation, right? Which is also given by Elias Barnabom and others. Um, where you can really just see it as all these uh, evaluations of the exogenous terms that agree with a certain intervention, say, right? And that's really what it is. Um, in general, it's also really nice to think of it in, in terms of this hierarchy, right? I believe you have seen it many times. Uh, this is a really nice also visualization. It's part also of the logo of our group. Um, and, and you really see the, the robot and, and the animal. Uh, on, on this first letter where all of statistics is being placed and deep learning and then doing and imagining is, is really what lies beyond, right? This one thing is kind of hypothetical and, and the other one is, is retrospective. Um, and a nice result from Barnbaum and others was really just proving that this, this hierarchy is a hierarchy indeed. Uh, here also some pointers, just general pointers, right? Which I believe are always really nice. Um, again, I can also share the slides. So, so if, if Neil has a way of sharing those, um, we can definitely share the slides. Um, also, code tutorials. Um, there's a couple of which I was involved in, and uh, you can always feel free to play around with them or share them with students or, or whatever. Okay, now the second part, uh, which is, I guess, less, uh, less kind of um, trivial in this case and important to our work. So it's really this whole thing of explainable AI. Um, again, I was not able to polish these slides, so excuse me if I have this now. Uh, essentially as, as these snapshots from the paper, but we are going through them, right? So, so we are going through them and, and using them to kind of um, really uh, work up this, this whole work. So um, yeah, so, so there has been a really a great body of work within deep learning that has provided kind of these visual means of explanations, you know, of how a neural model came up with a decision, right? And, and neural models are of course used because, well, the, <laughs> their success has been undeniable. Um, and and, and a lot of these things, especially with computer vision, because it's very natural, right? Like you can provide a kind of heat map and, 
and, and, and then say, oh, it's an explanation, right? Well, obviously people from psychology and cognitive science would say, but that's not really explanation, right? So it's, it's more like Stamet, I'll put it, it's like a children that are, you know, really only able to point fingers, but lack articulation, right? Um, so it's, it's really just what people have been doing, kind of giving these kind of attribution values to how important a certain thing is, right? It's more reminiscent in that sense of something like, say, Granger causality. Um, uh, what was also very interesting is the setup of XIL, which we're going to discuss in a second, where uh, Tizo and Kersting, so my, my advisor was also involved in that one, um, where they kind of um, propose this interactive thing, right? And, and that's a lot closer to the causal kind of things because, um, or, or the Perlian causality, because you really, you close the loop with the system and, and, and kind of um, get human knowledge in there, which not necessarily, but, but oftentimes will actually be causal information or based on, on, on something that is underlying the causal. Um, and, and so still there have been these um, works, for example, by Schwab and Kahn from ETH, which have actually taken Granger causality in this case as an inspiration, but have tried to make these explanations causal, these say heat maps, right? Um, by having some kind of notion of, of intervention in this case, right? Like, or, or how important is a certain item to predict another item or feature, right? Um, what was also interesting works by Karim et al from, from MPI um, that, you know, look at, for example, getting a loan accepted, right? And, and then that's a decision, it's a binary decision, right? But there's obviously a lot of features and uh, you want to have it, um, you, you can actually formalize this in a counterfactual setting where you're saying like, what's the closest counterfactual that I need to get so that decision flips, right? So that I really uh, get this loan now, right? And, 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 and they have constraints like plausibility that you cannot change your gender or something like that. So, so there has been definitely been works in explainability, fairness, accountability from a causal perspective, be it Granger or Perlin causality as, as we discussed mainly. Um, and, and there's also been these just purely XAI works um, which are kind of reminiscent of a child pointing its finger and, and also ways of setting up a loop, right? So, so that the models improve. So that's really this, this, this whole, whole game with the XAI. And so now turning from XAI to XIL, right? So where the IL stands for interactive learning. So this is now from, from this, this paper, Tizon Casting. I've shown you this, this algorithm here on, on, on the left. Um, really just, so, so you kind of fit, uh, fit, fit your model. And then, you know, you ask a certain query and now you have this opportunity of exploit, explaining, right? So this is the blue part, whatever this, in this case, Z, Z tilde is, right? So it's some kind of explanation, which is given to the user. It must at least be understandable by the user, right? And the user can then, you know, provide an explanation, a, a correction to this, uh, which is then being fed into the system again, and you refit and you repeat the loop, right? And by this, the model gets better. And what's really interesting, I believe, is, is this distinction on the right-hand side that, you know, there's these settings. So you can be right for the right reasons. You can be wrong for the wrong reasons. You can be right for the wrong reasons. So for example, to discuss just this last part, you know, that the model could actually find the right answer, but it could be for totally nonsense reason, right? Or, or for very spurious reasons. And, and that's a causal notion essentially right and so um just to to illustrate this so it's been famous in in the literature so far this this clever hunt situation right also in psychology so so what you see on the left here is, is actually this horse after which it is named it's called hans right it was german horse this ola trava horse um and uh in the beginning of the 20th century essentially um, this horse would be solving arithmetic questions, right? Um, and turns out it, it didn't do actually arithmetics, right? So it was right, but for the wrong reasons, because it was just extremely good in, in, in reading the, the humans and how they anticipated an answer, right? So they would just move their body in a way that they wouldn't even notice. Uh, and that was acting like kind of as a confounder. Um, and so this is the, the, the true story. And this was the name given to all these methods what you can see now here on the right hand side, so this was published in Nature Communications, where you will see again uh, kind of these visual explanations, right? And, and, and what you see, it's, it's classifying that, that there's a horse on the image, but actually what it's using is this kind of caption, right? And it's actually written in German. It's written Pferde Photo Archive, which translates to the archive of, of, of horse pictures, right? And of course, that will be a very good, you know, indicator of, of there being horse on it, right? Um, but it's obviously not a thing that you want the model to look at in a sense, right? And so um, 
yeah, th this is kind of this clever hands problem. And because we are going to use and adapt this example to a causal setting, uh, I'm just showing you this right now for your background. Okay, so just briefly, the motivation and, and, and what's really new in, in our work. So, so the motivation is really that, you know, in this SIL that we have just seen, the user queries the learner, and then the learner explains his answer to the user, and then the loop repeats, right? So there's really this kind of communication. And it's attractive for two reasons, right? So one of them is really that the learner becomes better, right? Because obviously the, the human can, or, or probably, I mean, we're assuming that the human can help, right? And when the human can help, it becomes better. And the second thing is, and, and that's a uh, more and more important thing, especially with all these AI ethics, ethics questions and all these new models coming out, right? That the user trust is really increasing, right? So, so these are kind of the two dimensions we argue which are uh, attractive for, for XIL. Um, and to, to fulfill both of these reasons actually, right? The learner's explanations must be useful and the user must be allowed to actually ask useful questions, right? And we further argue that both these questions and explanations should be grounded in the causal models because of these various fallacies that, that can otherwise occur, right? As with the, the, the clever Hans example. And so essentially everything is pointing towards a, a causal still notion, right? So that's really the motivation behind the work. And what we believe to contribute is the following. So first of all, we kind of identify that, you know, what is there is, is kind of not good, right? So even when you provide these methods with a structural causal model, they can somehow not use it. Um, then we derive a solution and we call this SCE, right? Because it uses the SCM. Uh, we call it SCE because it's using the structural causal information. Um, but it's an explanation, right? So, so we just call it SCE for structural cause explanation. And we conduct actually several experiments, which I'm going to guide us through here. Um, and actually also have a user study, which is pretty cool because explanations at the end of the day are a human kind of thing. Um, and it's a not just psychological question, but even philosophical question uh, of what really is an explanation, what is an interpretation and so on and so forth, right? And we don't even have to go in there, um, but it's cool that we have a human component here. So these are our contributions. Now, this will be, I guess, the main bulk of today's talk. So we are going to derive the, the causal Hans example, right? So you see the word plane analogy now to the clever Hans thing. This is gonna be the causal Hans example, right? In this case, Hans will not be a horse, but it'll be actually uh, a human, yeah? So a human named Hans. So before we start though, there's one kind of philosophical point. It's not really important for deriving the algorithm and using it or whatever, but it kind of, you know, if, if this is fulfilled, then it gives it more merit, I'd say. So you can actually represent thoughts in terms of SCM. That's kind of this hypothesis that there's some kind of, not equivalence, but entailment of, you know, the, the uh, human mental model, right? And our thought processes within SCM. We are not talking about that this is ever guaranteed or whatever, right? I mean, we, we cannot show this, but we are talking about the fact that somehow we can think in terms of an SCM, right? Like we can capture our thoughts intuitively in, in terms of an SCM. At least graphically, this seems very intuitively, and we just argue that we further not just have, you know, know that there's a certain edge in a graph, but also maybe whether it's, you know, a positive or negative relationship. And that will already be a linear SCM, essentially. Uh, actually, we give a kind of also proof in, in the paper for that. And, and this is what you see here. So here's actually the Hans that we are going to talk about, this elderly German person. And um, we are, considering kind of four quantities of interest now in, the, in, in all of the following example. So there's a thing called age, food habits, health, and mobility. And these are really just intuitively these things that you think of, um, and we capture them somehow numerically, right? So age could really be age in years. Food habits could be something lying on, I don't know, the, the real numbers from zero to one, uh, where one indicates, for example, really good food habits. Uh, health could be in, in, in natural numbers. It really doesn't matter. So we choose one kind of um, uh, coding system in this case to, to represent all these properties, essentially features, right? As you would discover them everywhere in machine learning. And so now Hans um, has kind of, you know, his thought process of, of you know, um, how these four factors relate to each other causally, uh, we could describe now with the following SCM that we see here. So that uh, age is really just, you know, some kind of distribution. In this case, we're saying uniformly. It's actually not correct quite because obviously there's, you know, there's tails to it. But let's just say, okay, there's uniform distribution from zero to 100, say in, in years. And then um, 
food habits would be a function in this case for hunts of, of the age, right? And some other noise term. And we said food habits get better the, the older you are, uh, or, or are better the higher they are. And, and now you can see from this functional formulation that essentially if a person is older, uh, the food habits will be better, right? And however, this, this UF is distributed, um, you know, can be arbitrarily complex. And essentially we can play the whole game, right? So, so we can see that uh, health is essentially being computed from the food habits and, and, and the age. Um, and that age, for example, has a negative effect, right? So that, you know, the older you get, the, the, the more your health deteriorates. Um, and then mobility is just a descent of, of, of health, right? And the cool thing is when you take this kind of perspective, you can suddenly also compare different uh, humans, right? And, and their mental models, so to say, because the SCM gives a mathematical framework for that. So what you see here in, 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 in this uh, space, uh, capital M here, that you have all these different SEMs of all these different people, for example, Jonas and Kurt, right? Uh, and now you can already get a hint of, of, of how we depict these people. So Jonas is kind of this, this sports college student, whereas Kurt is, say, a, a drug, drug addict or something. And, and now you can tell that, you know, Kurt and, and, and Hans or Kurt and Jonas are further away from each other than, than Hans and Jonas, right? So, so, so Jonas has, through his sports education, has learned a lot about, you know, things that Hans has gained throughout a lifetime experience, essentially, right? So these kind of things, right? So, so the main point is really here, okay, we can, you know, think of, of our thoughts in a sense of, uh, of an SEM, and it's more of a philosophical point, which I, I think just gives this a, a better grounding, this whole discussion that we have. Okay, now here's a big diagram. No worries, I'll, I'll get us through this. So this is kind of the causal loop that we propose, and this now before our derivation, right? So, so remember, I, I told you that we are going to go through this step by step uh, in this in this fourth part of the talk, and um, that's why I'm having these kind of uh, blocks here, which are uh, cutting the things off. So um, these are the things which will fill in eventually now, right? Um, so where do we start? We start essentially with the user, right? So again, remember, still interactive. So there's a human component. This is the human component. Say we are in a medical setting, right? So we were already talking about individuals like Hans, Jonas, and Kurt. And uh, here now there's a medical doctor and a developer, right? And the medical doctor, of course, is an expert on, on or, or has some kind of intuition uh, that is, you know, assumably uh, beneficial for, for the setting that we are looking at, in this case, medicine, of course, right? Uh, if it were code, say, then of, obviously this bubble and, and, and the assumptions would be on the developer side. And, and, and so we can say, okay, you know, it has this kind of assumption here, say, right? So age affecting food habits and so on and so forth. And ideally, it should really just contain true assumptions about a latent SEM that at the end of the day, we are really interested in, right? So, so that's somehow where we want to get at but more generally in science, right? Like we want to discover the causal relationships. Here we're talking about the explanations, right? But still in the whole loop, uh, somewhere we have to have the true SEM and that's why we put it here and also in this gray box because it's unobserved, right? But it generates the data, right? And that's also a base assumption, right? It generates our data. It generates essentially these attributes, right? Through physical mechanisms of why Hans is in a certain way. And now you can see also here a numerical description that's essentially the event individual captured um, yeah, under the name Hans. So what happens? So, so the user, right? Medical doc and developer, there's some intuition and now they observe data, right? So say these patient records with Hans and everyone else. And essentially what we imagine now in this loop is that there's some way of asking a question about the data, right? So that's why these two arrows follow here to the question. Then, of course, this we know we can do. There's learning algorithms for, you know, causal inference, causal discovery, where we can learn some kind of structure. And then from the learn structure and also from the question, we somehow need to derive an explanation, right? Um, and now this explanation can be fed back to the team. And now we would go with the green arrows, not the black ones, to kind of tweak the learning and, 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 and according to, to the explanation we have received from the black path, right? To, to then explain and, and, and feedback and, and finally be happy, right? And, and through this, essentially get closer to the true SEM, right? So this is really the big picture view. And we are going to fill in now these, these blocks. So um, asking questions about individuals. So um, this example we'll call causal hunts example because we look at individual hunts and, and it's gonna be causal. Um, and so what we do is essentially um, say we have again these 
these four variables, right? Age, food habits, health, and mobility. Um, and, and let's consider now samples from this SCM. So this could be Hans, right? So Hans has some kind of instantiation and say it's, it's like this here, right? So Hans is 93 years old, um, but is a rather immobile person, right? Because this 20, 26.2 uh, for mobilities is rather low, right? Um, and so this, this kind of rather low, we can actually capture by, you know, looking at the population, right? And comparing it, right? Like that's is essentially what we argue we implicitly do, right? Like actually when you look at say an average of the sample, say with Jonas and Kurt, they, they, the average is 35.6, right? And so obviously that's, that's, that's bigger in this case than, than the mobility for Hans. So, so that's kind of why we say it's bad, right? And so when we compare somehow, you know, relate to, to a whole population, um, then essentially we can pose a question like this, right? Like, why is Hans's mobility so bad, right? And, and, and bad really, again, refers to relative to the population. Okay, so this is kind of a question which can nat naturally come up, right? Using the word why, which is also, again, the causal quantity and, and, and kind of the, the, the individuals and, 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 um, and, and their kind of SEM properties, their uh, values for their endogenous terms. So now we can actually formalize this and, and that's how we do it here, right? So essentially we have some kind of comparison, uh, we have some kind of measure, right? So in this case, we just take the empirical mean. Uh, you could generalize this and we thought about this. I mean, naturally you could already use something like the median or something, but still given that we just investigated this mainly, uh, we didn't want to claim it here now in the definition. And then there's some kind of relation, say greater or smaller, right? So it's so a binary ordering relation. And now we can just define it as the following, where we say, okay, the question regarding um, uh, variable X is really just this relation that you have chosen for the value of that individual compared to the, in this case, uh, mean of the population. And so if we check now with this definition, we can tell that, you know, um, mobility is really, uh, it's, 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 it's a fair thing to say, right? Like if mobility of Hans was higher than, 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 um, than, the, uh, than the mean, then obviously asking that question would not make sense, right? And that's really what this definition is trying to capture. Okay, so now what does an SCM tell us about Hans, right? So we, we figured kind of that we could already ask these questions. Um, and, and now next, we will figure out with these assumptions that we have, these structural assumptions and, and what we learned from the graph, what, what can we tell, right? And um, yeah, so, so you know, the, the medical doc, right? We, we can say could have some kind of assumption, say, you know, that A is, 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 is the cause of F with some kind of, say it was a linear SCM with some kind of coefficient alpha, but then also for beta and then F to H with gamma and so on. And then say they are all greater than zero, except for beta is smaller than zero, right? Then if we have this and you can, you know, confirm this and, and play this out, um, then, you know, we actually have everything in a sense to answer the question we have posed in Q1, right? So we observed that M is an effect of H with gamma being greater than zero, meaning that since Hans has below average health and not just below average mobility and lower health translates to lower mobility, you know, because of that causal relation, that MH is actually in line with HH, right? So with the health of Hans. Um, and now you can actually traverse this, this, this chain, right? Like you can go up to the ancestors um, and, and play the same game. And for example, since A is above the age of Hans, is, you know, Hans is an elderly person, and, but beta is smaller than zero. So there's kind of this reverse, this underproportional effect. You can conclude that AH is definitely an explanation for, for HH, right? So that the higher age is actually indicative of, of the lower health. Um, Whereas now there's a contrast because F actually has a positive gamma and, you know, better food habits usually mean better health. So that will be a countering factor. So we see there's already some kind of dynamics happening here. And actually, when we just summarize all of these things, we can come up with explanation one for Q1, which would read as Hans mobility is bad because of his bad health, which again is mostly due to his high age, although his food habits are actually good. And we argue that this is a truly causal answer now because by construction right so by definition uh we have used the causal model the underlying causal model to conclude this this answer essentially this explanation right and it captures both the relations but also the strengths of the relations which is something we also argued for before with the philosophical point right um and so 
this essentially allows us to move forward to, to computing causal explanations explicitly and automatically. So how do we capture this? So essentially what we did was, you know, deriving uh, in logic now uh, rules, you know, using these causal semantics, right? Uh, you know, given the interest of time, I'll actually be skipping this part now, but I will be telling you that essentially we have these three rules, right? Um, so ER1, ER2, and ER3. ER1 and ER2 are the main rules, we can say. So ER3, uh, we were already thinking of maybe not calling it a rule, but just a kind of modifier because it acts as a modifier to, to both one and two. So what one and two are really doing is capturing these two cases that we were just discussing. So ER1 would be a case for the age and health, right? So age is kind of increasing um, and is, uh, is above average. Um, and, and, and since it has a, a negative effect on, 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 on health, right? That will be you know described by these rules right so it looks rather complicated but it's it's really simple so you're looking at these causal effects or on for a linear SCMD coefficients you're comparing them and then you're looking at the knowledge about you know the, the thing you're questioning right now and the and, and the potential cause right and 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 with this essentially you can then we can actually show that you can construct these kind of rules and, and we'll do that in a moment because that's more important um just to give you an intuition on these rules. So ER1, we kind of called excitation because it's really this thing of Y because of X. And then again, because X is low or high or, or, or somehow a place, right? So some relative measure, but really, you know, as a neuroscience, you know, excitor neurons or whatever, um, you know, it's, it's really, that's the thing which is triggering it, right? And that's why you call it like that. Um, and inhibition is the reverse process, although, right? Although the food habits were good actually, uh, you know, the health is, is, is still bad, right? So it is kind of, you know, trying to counter that, but it's, uh, you know, that's, that's the intuition here. And ER3 is then a preference. It's a modifier, as you can see, plus the, the rule one or two pronunciation, where you say something like mostly. So it's, it's, it's just saying that, okay, you know, if, if, you have a, if you have a car accident, that'll be worse for your health and mobility than say your average session at the gym will do good, right? So there's strengths to causal relations. And so that's really just for the rules. And now, so assuming now, please trust me now with the rules that they are fine, uh, you can actually derive an algorithm, right? And this is now what we call the structural causal explanation, right? Because it'll check these rules essentially, and then construct for you automatically in natural language, these sentences that we have seen. And how does it work? So again, it looks probably terribly complicated, but it really is not. So it's just a recursion. So you start where you're asking the question, say, you know, why is Hans mobility mad? So you look for Hans at the mobility node. And now, you know, X would be in this case, M, the mobility node. You have knowledge on your structural causal model and the data set. And now what it really is, you check for the current nodes, in this case, mobility, the parents, there's just one, it's, it's, it's health. And then you continue building this code here um, by going into the parents of the parents and so on and so forth. So you really just recursively traverse uh, each of the paths. Um, and now we can actually just test this. I, th I think this is better for the intuition. So really just, this is how it looks like for, for the Hans example now. Remember, so we had this explanation, right? So Hans mobility is bad because of blah, blah, blah. And now here we have an automatic scheme for doing this, right? And, and now you can not just do it for, for this simple medical example, you can do it for anything really, right? So you start here, you see that uh, the first rule would trigger for the health relationship and it would be triggering with minus one, minus one or, or plus one. That's really just a, a code for telling us whether it's, you know, because of say low health or, 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 or high health or good health, right? And then it just goes here, right? So the color coding is really there to, to show kind of the, the different levels, right? So first you, you go from M to H, then you go to, to the food habits and, 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 the, uh, and, the, and the age factor. And then there you actually reach the base case and that's denoted by this empty set symbol here. And with this actually, we have concluded the loop, right? So that's a pretty cool thing here. So now we have filled these things out. So the questions we could ask is something like, why is Hans mobility bad? And, and this you do by simply measuring the value of Hans relative to population. With your learning algorithm, you might learn a structure like this and, 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 and see here, for example, it's, it's so the true causal graph actually has some kind of coefficients here, but doesn't have this extra edge. Structurally, it's like a superstructure in this case. And now the explanation which you would get out of this would be something like Hans mobility in spite of his age 
mostly because of his bad health, you know, is bad mostly because of his bad health, which is bad mostly due to his good food habits. And now everyone would be, huh, this doesn't make any sense. That's the thing, right? So, so this was automatically generated now here with this, this, this uh, explanation scheme, right? But the explanation scheme is independent of whether the assumptions are correct or useful, right? So it's just a consistent way of generating these explanations. And so this now goes back to the medical doc, right? And he looks at that and he's like, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. And, and, and figures out with the developer what the model is thinking in a sense is wrong. That's the still part, right? Like, you know that there's something wrong and you identify. And now the developer has discussed with the medical doc tweak the learning in such a way that now the following graph comes out, right? And say, this is now the correct one. Then if you again run our explanation, right? Then you now get the answer that you actually wish for, which is, you know, Hans mobility is bad because of his bad health, which is mostly due to high age, although the food habits are good. And it feeds back to the, to the medical doc and the medical doc is happy now because the explanation makes totally sense. And again, this was all automatically generated, right? Like we learned from data, this graph, we learned, from the graph and, and the question we post automatically the explanation. Learning is actually the wrong word here because we actually just computed it, right? So, so we derived this algorithm. Okay, so now quickly, I, I just wanna show you briefly the experiments we have done essentially, right? So we won't have time to go into this in detail, but maybe we can use the, the questions at the end as well to, to discuss this. Um, so there's some noteworthy properties, right? Which we show and prove. So for example, in any kind of causal scenario, right? So all the information that you need for computing the rules, um, you will always see that it's either excitation or inhibition. It's actually never happening at the same time. So they're mutually exclusive. Um, the recursion always terminates. So that's also a desirable property. And then now this here, which we kind of, it's almost trip, it's actually almost trivial to prove this, but it's a, we believe a very important result that essentially anything that really learns causal structures now can be explained. And, and we find this really cool because all these people have focused on learning the causal structure and somehow it already gives us an intuition, but it's really not an explanation, right? And now you can tell them, hey, however nice your method is, the nicer it is, the better your explanations will actually also be, right? Because you can explain stuff. Um, then we, we actually checked, right? So we said that uh, initially that, you know, some of these methods are, are not, not good enough or, or you know, they, they are not, um, not truly causal, right? And this is what you see here. So, so we took one of these, in this case, C explain. It's a great method, right? And, and, and really just, we are kind of building up from, from what people have done pre prior to this, um, but still there's this certainly lack. And in, in this case, I'd say even it's ex uh, expected, but still you kind of have to discuss this, right? So, so uh, C explain is even not in Perlin causality, it's Granger causal, and it's one of these attribution methods. And so that's what you get essentially on the right-hand side. While in the middle, you have our structure, which is both a natural language and has very nice graphical intuition with this color coding. Uh, that's really on the right-hand side, what you get. And, and I bet everyone would say that the middle one is a better explanation, right? I certainly would so. And, um, and actually there's still, even when you take this as an explanation, there's uh, several problems with it. Uh, so for example, you know, you cannot know what is a direct effect or indirect effect, right? Uh, you also have no information on the causal effect, right? Like in which way is it actually affecting the variable? You just know that it is somehow, right? And there's actually two more of, of these issues. We have kind of discussed them in appendix. I won't go it now, um, but that's really the, it, right? So that's really showing you. And, and it's actually using the very same information as our algorithm, right? Like the the structural causal information that we've provided here, right? So it's a fair comparison in that sense. It's just lacking, right? And some of these things are by construction. And so um, that's why I said it's kind of expected, but uh, you have to highlight this because we kind of cannot stay with, with these kinds of methods, right? Um, now for quality of learned explanations, right? So it's super funny because, so, so what you see here is now four different of, you know, these toy data sets. So, so one of one, one, the one we discussed so far, but some other ones, for example, you know, altitude and temperature. Uh, and then you can ask the question, why is the temperature at the Matterhorn low? And then, you know, it's low, of course, because of the high altitude, right? And in this case, both a learning algorithm and, you know, the ground truth, they coincide. Um, but now, for example, when we even just look at this simple, you know, kidney stone Simpson's paradox example, then we can already tell that, you know, algorithms start failing. And um, it's what I find cool about this is that these explanations are also a kind of visualization for, for the mistakes that these algorithms make. 
um, because you know you read, for example, this blue part, which is the learned part, could did not recover because of pre pre bad precondition, which were bad, although he got treatment. And so now I can somehow just by reading this essentially, uh, and now imagine a co more complex system, figure out that um, that wh where the algorithm is wrong essentially. And 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 if you depict it graphically, you can tell that. The, the explanation doesn't have this edge from T to R, right? Like it doesn't talk about it. And so you know, could now go back into your algorithm and, and kind of fix it. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, we also had a nice setup of actually checking, uh, you know, how we could maybe, you know, improve graph learning. So um, what we did was we just took a graph learner, right? As with all these causal structure discovery methods. And now we added a regularization term. And the regularization was really just generating explanations of the current graph estimate and then checking them against some existing ground truths. And as expected, right, because the explanations contain information about the ground, ground truth, even if just partially, um, it improved learning, right? And you can see we checked here this with a lot of graphs and we could generally tell that, you know, you would have less false links with, with the explanation generalization, right? And you know, on an intuitive level, you can kind of say that uh, the graph that is being predicted kind of needs to be consistent with explanation. So uh, the, the graph learner somehow now needs to justify itself, right? And that's that's the cool part here. Then uh, this is, I believe, really the coolest part of, of, of the empirical study that we had this user study. So this is what we shared with essentially 22 participants. So they there were like four examples of you know different variables with some kind of intuitive meaning, and we were not doing a quantitative study, right? So we're not saying like oh give us the FCM or whatever or look at this data. No, we were it was chosen purposefully as like kind of common sense things, right? And now essentially they should just fill for each of the pairs whether there is a relation and if there is a relation, which direction and is it positive or negative? Where positive again means something like okay the older you are. Uh, the, the less is your health, so it's a negative relationship, right? And so this we gave the people, and then we, you know, collected the results, we aggregated them. There were essentially two main ways of doing so. Um, the, the one you see on the left is uh, of, you know, checking all the individual graphs and simply taking the mode, right? So, so which is the graph most agreed upon? This works very well for small graphs, but if they become larger, then it becomes a lot sparser. And so um, you cannot really identify a unique graph, especially because the number of DAX grows super exponentially. On the right hand side, this, this works better with general cases, but can create graphs that do not exist in any of the human you know, nodes because uh, it's greedy essentially. So it's looking just at which edge is usually chosen uh, most often. And, and just by doing this study, we discovered a lot of interesting things such as uh, uh, how humans actually interpret all these causal relationships, uh, which is highly non-trivial. Um, and just you know, to, to leave you off here with an experiment um, or the conclusion of this, uh, essentially the machines predicted, uh, you know, uh, well, that is what they, that is what we saw earlier with the with the with the blue one, with uh, the algorithms, and and that the humans are really just uh, in these simple cases like ground truth essentially, right? And um, makes sense is is as expected, but it also goes to show that this explanation framework that we came up with essentially really also can uh, kind of now illustrate this, right? It can really bring the message out, right? So, so everyone was kind of expecting humans to still perform these causal inferences better than, than machines, um, especially under the assumption that they are just, you know, on level one. Um, but now an explanation that we generate automatically, which is independent of whether it's true or not, I can now tell you this. And, and I truly find this very cool. Um, and now just to conclude a couple of, you know, recent works of ours just to highlight. So, you know, we have, we have done, done several things. So um, we had this work on, on, on you know, GNNs and, and SCMs with Peter Velichkovich from DeepMind. Uh, got a lot of attention in the community. Also, you know, Yuda tweeted about this and it felt like the whole community was going crazy. It was pretty cool. So there we kind of just theoretically investigated how SCMs and GNNs are related, especially because GNNs are super popular right now in machine learning. Um, we had this one workshop paper at iClear uh, for Linear programs, also very interesting. Uh, this one work on, on some product networks for tractable causal inference at NeurIPS. Um, we also looked at large language models, so that was also pretty cool. Even that one got a little attention. Um, and yeah, then there's been some other works also on just discussing tractability of uh, causal inference or neural causal inference specifically. 
again one on, on linear programs and then also from some uh, some collaborations um, and works from colleagues on you know like uh, pushing neural models in, into a causal direction or, or using it for solving very old problems like bonga problems which are to, to this day not being you know tackled because they're just so hard and with this i'm at the end um, and yeah happy to answer and, and happy to discuss yeah yeah thank you so much for that that was super interesting uh, fantastic thank talk you. um so we can do this in two ways um if any participants you can either type out your questions if you have one and i will read it out for you or you can just unmute yourself and you just ask the question to my day and I'm sure you'll answer very very well um i i can kick off um i may have misunderstood this so i'm gonna ask mm -hmm. the question in a general way what does your paper say about the uniqueness of the explanation generated so so what do you mean exactly by uniqueness so, so, so let's say this. yeah sure um so the example of hans so generated an explanation is there another explanation Oh, Could there okay. be another explanation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice question, nice question. So, so really, what it's, it's saying is, um, so it the, the algorithm is deterministic, so it's always going to be unique, given, of course, the same input, right? right? So, if you know, I have a different assumption about my causal graph, right? And, and now, independent of whether that one is more correct or not, right? It's just a different assumption about the causal graph that will generate a different explanation, right? And so, you can say now. Um, say we talk about abstracting different causal models yeah so so one looks at it more you know fine-grained one is kind of a micro and macro you know scm essentially um then you could argue that they would both produce the same uh, or or an explanation that is true to the same extent just that one would be more detailed and one less detailed right because one is from a macro scm and one is from a micro scm so yeah very cool thought but yeah definitely so so they are unique um, um, and, and, and they can still, you know, there could be multiple still explanations, which are equally true, assuming that, you know, your SEM models in a same correct way, but is an abstraction essentially, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, that's very interesting. Um, okay, cool. Any other questions from, from the audience? I, I don't bite, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> You dazzle them so much with your talk, they don't know what to say anymore. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot. And I mean, I haven't even gone through the details for some of these experiments. Um, okay. But yeah, I, I really like this work personally, so I, I want to discuss it. And, and again, also for everyone interested in the discussion group. So I'll, I'll leave the slides and, and, and also links with you. Mm. I'll feel free to share them, right? So yeah, yeah. When, when can we imagine to see this work um, in, in the public domain? Oh, yeah, good point. Would you, uh, would you reckon? I, I hope next year, no, early next year, I hope. I really okay. hope. Yeah, would be cool, okay. yeah. Okay, fantastic. Um, well, if there are no other questions, thank you so much again. That was a really good talk. I really enjoyed it. Thank you um, so much. Hopefully we'll see more, more of this when it comes around. Thank you um, so much, Neil, also again for the invitation. And, um, and, and yeah, I mean, if there's any questions, right, also coming up now, um, please let the people know they should just reach out to me, right? So, uh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I've posted your um, your group is on the chat now, so everyone knows how to contact you and, and your fantastic uh, discussion group. So we we'll hope so to much. see more of it. Yeah, thank you again. Okay, thank you so much. All the rest. Bye. Bye bye.